Welcome to another exciting episode of Kefjet, the podcast. I'm excited to introduce to you this week's guest, Al. We discuss his journey of sobriety and self-discovery. Some people are just not meant to drink, and I'm one of them. It is an important conversation. But I wish that I'd had access to other conversations back when I when I've needed them. I think, you know, for me, like life had become it's a bit of a cliche, I think, especially within like recovery circles, but I think it had become quite unmanageable. I was in a position where I felt that my personal and professional lives were imploding. You know, I carried around a lot of shame with my drinking. Al opens up about his struggles with alcohol and how he found the road to recovery. Okay, buckle up. People get sober for a number of reasons. I decided I had to get sober because I couldn't handle my relationship with alcohol. I couldn't hide it. I was getting into trouble at work. I was letting people down in my personal life. I was so unhappy. In recovery, you talk about reaching a rock bottom. Is there a right or a wrong way to help a loved one with addiction? Fundamentally, the only person who can help you is you. And that's what it comes down to. And I think that's the really frustrating, the really hard thing when you see someone who's suffering from addiction or who is not able to break out of that cycle is there is nothing you can do until they have learned that for themselves. In this candid conversation, Al delves into the depths of his battles, revealing the profound impact of support networks, accountability, and the LGBTQ plus community. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Al. Oof, I don't like these questions. They, they make me uncomfortable. Welcome, Al, to Kevjet the Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. I think it's a uh, a really important conversation to have, and I know our listeners will be tuning in for this one. Yeah, I am um, a little bit not nervous, but like I said, I think it's it's a really important conversation. And I thought when when you asked me about having this conversation, I really wanted to, uh, but I wish that I'd had access to other conversations back when I when I've needed them. So it's great to be here. Thank you very much. And I agree, it is an important conversation. Yeah, Um, I think everybody that will be tuning in will have known somebody or been affected in some way by the subjects that we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about your sobriety. Slim. Yeah, I'm ready. (laughs) Let's do this. So first of all, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Let's get to know you a little bit. Well, so uh, my name's Al. I am 33. I live in London. I work in events. I run my own business. I've always worked in sort of hospitality and events and um, creating fun times for people. And I love being at the centre of, uh, it sounds really cheesy, but human connection. So sort of connecting people to experiences, to each other, to brands, whatever that might be. A bit away from work. I really enjoy sports. I do a lot of long distance running. I use the word enjoy loosely, but I enjoy an ultra marathon. It's like the best thinking time. But yeah, sports is important to me. That's you. I saw the race across Scotland, which looked absolutely mental. That was that was quite intense. That was last year, 215 miles in 100 hours, just like going through the night very little sleep and get very, very precious at moments. But I really like the bit when you get really into it with yourself in terms of the sort of, it's like a mental inventory and you just get down to basics where it's like one foot in front of the other and that is all you can focus on and you're completely alone and no one can help you and you just have to get through it by yourself. And like as as horrendous as they can be, they are also incredibly fulfilling. Just some of the best experiences that I've had. That's mental. I um, I don't think I could do that. Yeah, it's quite an extreme piece. I think that that's fair. And, you know, and each to their own, you know, different like horses for courses, right? I enjoy them. Again, use that term loosely, but I get a lot from them. It's probably a better way of putting it. In some ways, it's your form of meditation or just finding yeah. peace. Uh, no, I could not agree with that more. You know, you are 
quite often by yourself it's not like a road marathon where you're surrounded by hundreds of people running and you're not necessarily like running for time you're running to finish like run walk or crawl and like you said you really get into it mentally with yourself and sort quite a lot of stuff out um just like tune out put a good playlist in bit of Fleetwood Mac on you go yeah I get quite excited about them until I start them. And then I'm <laughs> after about half a day, I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> so, yeah. When you get to that finish line and it's over, do you feel like a sense of accomplishment or do you feel, is it, is it almost like a hangover? Like it's, Oh my gosh, it's over now. So what, what's next? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a bit of relief. Definitely a sense of accomplishment because quite often you'll have been going for, you know, it might've been, a few days um the longest one I've done is eight days and in all kinds of weather so yeah definitely a sense of relief sense of achievement normally when I did the one last year I promised myself that I was never going to do anything like that again but you know full well that a week afterwards you'll be like browsing google <laughs> what's next um, yeah exactly I've got one this year around Anglesey which is three days uh, in August, which I am again looking forward to use that term loosely. <laughs> well, I wish you luck. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> talking about being athletic, you are a member of the King's Cross Steelers rugby team. Yeah. Yeah. That keeps you busy. It does. We're so we're training at the moment. Our main season is finished, but we're back training two days a week for Bingham, which is a tournament that takes place every two years where a lot of the inclusive and gay rugby clubs from around the world are invited to take part. So this year it's in Rome at the end of May. We were in Canada two years ago. King's Cross Steelers won the, the Bingham Cup uh, two years ago. So we're back to defend. So the Canadians didn't win. The Canadians did not win because the King's Cross Steelers did. But they, they did very well. They did very well. Very nice as well. Very hospi- hospitable. Is that the word? Hospitable. Right That's right. Well, Okay. Yeah. It seemed very nice. What city were you in? Ottawa. Nice. Okay. Yeah. You're involved with sports. You're involved in the LGBTQ plus community. You're in events. All these things are very social. Yeah. So let's talk about how we got to your sobriety. What led up to it? What was your life like before you got to the point where you thought, um, I need to do something here? I have, I'm 33 now. I the last time I stopped drinking I was 29 but I've been sober before that you know I've experimented with sobriety probably since 17 18 um and sometimes it stuck sometimes it didn't I had a spell sober at 24 for 18 months and now it's been over four years and it's something I'm committed to and I'm not looking to make any changes but in terms of why I got sober the last time I think, I think, you know, for me, like life had become, it's a bit of a cliche, I think, especially within like recovery circles, but I think it had become quite unmanageable, mm-hmm. uh, if I'm honest. I think that I was in a position where my, I felt that my personal and professional lives were imploding. I carried around a lot of shame with my drinking. People get sober for a number of reasons. I decided I had to get sober because I couldn't handle my relationship with alcohol fundamentally. And that generates a lot of shame for me because I couldn't drink like a normal person, but I also couldn't maintain sobriety. So it'd be like these two week cycles where you'd swear off it, you'd have a big night, you'd do something that either you felt embarrassed about or sort of caused you anxiety or you had another blackout. And then and you'd swear off drinking again, but then two weeks later, you'd do the same. And it was like, it's like I could time it to perfection. I um, knew exactly what was going to happen. But in, in, it felt like throughout this time, or throughout periods of my life, like keeping a big secret and trying not to let people see it. Um, so work or friends or uh, my partner, family. And it got to a point where it was just seeping everywhere. Like I couldn't, I couldn't hide it. I was getting into trouble at work. I was letting people down in my personal life. I was so unhappy. You know, I remember just feeling like I was at a junction where I knew that 
I could either, you know, one way, I could I could go one of two ways. One way was to push the big red fuck it button and just like detonate everything and just live in that and like ab- like and knowing that I created chaos and that I knowingly did that. And the other was to say, this can't work for me and I have a choice and I'm going to choose to give that up and work to do that. So that's when I stopped. And how did you find the support to help you maintain that? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Join us each week on the Well Beyond Medicine podcast as we explore the 80% of child health impacts that occur outside the doctor's office. Listen and subscribe at NemoursWellBeyond.org, where you'll hear pediatric experts, researchers, and policymakers from around the world discussing ways they are revolutionizing children's health. I'm your host, Carol Vassar. Let's go. So I had, I've got a few friends who are in recovery, one of them to whom I will always be grateful, probably about, so I stopped drinking in the February and I think it was probably about the October, November before that, you know, I, I was wanting to, you know, I was talking about stopping again. I have a good friend who I actually haven't spoken to for a while, but just like one of those friends who you can just call. Mm-hmm. And I was speaking to her and she told me or she invited me to come to a meeting with her at uh, some rooms that she uh, goes to or went to in Soho. And I went and I liked the meeting and I liked the people. And I went back a few times and that didn't get me sober, but it got me on the road that meant I was sober in the February. It got me thinking about it. So I've had some, I've been very lucky to have some brilliant friends who can understand sobriety, who can understand addiction and, you know, what it is to like really abuse like alcohol Mm -hmm. and the unhappiness and like all those pieces that you can feel with it. I think it's difficult to understand it if you haven't experienced it. And I also say this, like I have people who are close to me who suffer, who are in active addiction, um, which means they are still suffering. They're not necessarily quite in recovery. And it is so frustrating and it can be like heartbreaking and like, why can't someone just stop? So it's it's really difficult to understand. So I've had a lot of support. I've been very lucky just after I stopped drinking was the, um, it was very shortly later, like the first lockdown, <laughs> which didn't hurt in the sense that I couldn't go out. I was never one to drink at home. I was always one to go and burn brightly in public somewhere. But it meant that I really sat with myself for a few months and sort of thought about thought about a lot of stuff. But I've, I've been very lucky to have some great support along the way. The support is such an important part of it. Personally, my my younger sister, I, well, I only have one sister. She hasn't had a drink for, I think, over eight years now. Amazing. And she sort of did it all on her own. And it was, it, she came, she got to a breaking point, but obviously I live in a different country. She didn't really have a whole lot of support at home. The people who thought they were supporting her were sort of telling her off and telling her all the reasons why she shouldn't be drinking and how she's ruining her life and all this, um, which in their eyes, they believed they were supporting her. But when you look back at it, it wasn't being supportive at all. And I think she has actually come a long way in it was a breaking point for her and she's changed her life around a hundred percent. She has the most amazing life now and has taken control of it. She has herself to be thankful for because I think you just have to find it in yourself to take that power. Congrats to your sister. That's, I know I say congrats, like it's not like a finish line is crossed. You know, eight years is amazing and great to hear that she's doing well. I completely agree with you. I think that in recovery you talk about reaching a rock bottom and you talk about how like fundamentally the only person who can help you is you and that's what it comes down to like, and I think that's the really frustrating the really hard thing when you see someone who's suffering from addiction or who is not able to break out of that cycle is there is nothing you can do 
big until they have learned that for themselves and until you know you, you just there is nothing you can do and I, I can't even tell you what that support looks that what the support should look like I think that depends on the the person I think for for me it was being held accountable I actually don't know how I don't know how effective this was if you go back and ask people at the time like how aware they were I don't know what they would say probably some were quite aware um but you know I remember talking to I remember I was seeing a sort of life slash like business coach when I was probably about 27 and I remember like talking about something that happened at work and how um and like some casual like throwaway remark about going out and getting like wrecked on a Wednesday night at a work event and then being out until like three o'clock in the morning and then something had happened and something had happened and then you know whether something had happened like at the work event and I just remember the coach like putting their pen down and sort of looking at me and they said you know that's not that's not acceptable behavior I was like I'm sorry I was telling my funny story like what <laughs> what do you mean and you know I think that alcoholism or addiction is can be incredibly selfish disease you're quite self-centered tends to be sort of fighting fires and like very chaotic and like very self-centered and it's very hard to see other people and other people's needs sometimes and that's not to say that you're a bad person for not seeing them because but you just don't so having that mirror held up to you sometimes and someone explaining to you the impact of your behavior and you um, remember that conversation to, to yeah, this day 100 percent. i think also by the time i stopped drinking i was like i spoke about alcohol in the same way that you speak about a partner that you need to break up with or about a job that you need to leave and i think i've been speaking about it for months or years and saying you know i really need to stop and you're just like just do it then like go on like it's, please you're so boring stop talking about it and just do it but having yeah that accountability do you feel that, and perhaps you did, but do you feel that having loved ones around you who are like, I love you so much and I want you to change your life because of this would be, would have been or was more effective than somebody being with around you being like, oh, just fucking stop talking about it and doing it. Or let's just go and have a drink and get over yourself. Or, Oh, it's a tough one. I think this is a, it depends on your personality type. So I'm not going to psychoanalyze myself too much. <laughs> Like, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I think you have to speak to people. The best way to communicate it is to people in terms that they best understand, which is, so that can be difficult to know. Like, so for me, for someone to be like, you know, I really love you. Like, please like stop doing this. That wouldn't work with me. Like, I think probably for me, part of the, um, part of the piece is that I really hated myself. I really really hated myself I felt like the biggest piece of shit in the room so no what no matter what you said I'd be like well it literally I did not even register so I think that you know for me it was when I looked to look to my life and I was like you actually have you know you've got a good job you've got a really good relationship you've got great friends you've got a good life this is actually within your control you know to to help yourself like I think I kind of had this narrative where you know I always chose the wrong path where you know I, it was almost like predetermined I was trying to explain this to someone the other day um it's quite difficult but you know so you'd be on a night out for instance um and it was a Tuesday and you're on a night out on a Tuesday and it's 11 and you should be going home because you're going to work the next day and you have a little voice in your head that says it's time to go it's the last tube soon. And you know that you're not going to because you're not going to because that's just what you do because you are just that person who stays and that person who gets another drink and maybe gets one for the stranger they've met at the bar and you're going to leave when it's kick out time at three o'clock in the morning. And then because this is just the way life is. And I think that you, for me anyway, you get to a point where you can really normalise behavior whether it's that whether it's blackout drinking whether it's sort of dangerous or reckless behavior that's it's a really dark state to get into and like quite hard to break yourself out of mm -hmm. what 
were the things that you hated about yourself? I just, I felt so like always less than always that I was never good enough and that I had something to prove to everyone. So I think that's why it was also like really devastating to me when I would like self-destruct with alcohol and like almost, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy when you're like, well, yeah. You know, I think if I look at when I started drinking, when I was probably like 14 or 15, <laughs> when I was younger, I was like quite, a, you probably call me like a vicious overachiever, academics, sport, you know, all the, did quite a lot of like music and drama and like everything. I was probably quite annoying, to be honest. And as I got older, I found the, and I found the pressure of maintaining that like really difficult. Mm -hmm. And that and like social pressures and getting older. And I didn't really feel like I quite like fit in. And I think, you know, just decided to have a drink. One day, I think I was with a group of people got drunk and it felt like a bit of an escape you always hear oh well they just started hanging out with the wrong crowd is that something that you would say to be true or would, do you think that's an excuse I think you know it depends on the person I think that you know we all have you know this, you're young you know have the ability to decide what you're doing and I knew what I was doing was wrong um in that it wasn't good for me it was also legal did you ever find it enjoyable? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it was a you know a release. When I was younger, um, I'd been quite depressed, and it was a way of just putting a pin in something uh, for a time. And I think also what alcohol can give you, especially if you're feeling sort of isolated or lonely, it can give you that sense of connection to. To someone else there's a brilliant book written by um the journalist johan harry called chasing the screen which talks about like constructs of addiction and the war on drugs absolutely fascinating would really recommend it and his one of his like central hypothesis is that the opposite of um addiction isn't sobriety it's human connection and so i think you know for me you're like picking up a bottle when I was like 14, 15, or to get a bit of an escape, but also to feel something with someone. Yeah, I get that. How has that affected your friendships and your, the social aspect of your life? Did you, did you lose friends, first of all? Um, I mean, when I was like in my early twenties, uh, I was like working in bars um, and was I think the the persona that I created for myself was like life and soul at the party. That was probably a bit of an extension from um, like late teens and stuff. I think that, you know, I knew a lot of people would be out all the time, would be out drinking all the time. And then when I stopped, when I stopped four years ago, I mean, it's hard to say because there was like the lockdowns, which were mm -hmm. a bit of a special dampener in themselves. But I think what I found is that my natural inclination isn't to be the life and soul of the party. I'm actually quite happy just being a bit more chilled and stepped back from that. And that's not to say that that outlook can't change over time. I mean, it's not to say that it wasn't an organic outlook back then. But as a result now, my social circle is much smaller. I think I look for, you know, what I want to find socially is like that sense of connection to people but I don't find it through alcohol now. So I have, I don't have like the drinking buddies who I probably wasn't really, I didn't have much in common and I would say hi to, and you'd have the most amazing time when you were pissed, but you couldn't really remember why. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's like people with like shared interests or maybe personality or a sense of humor or something there. So it tends to be a bit more of a sort of deeper friendship, but I've got less of them. And you could very well be you're still the life of the party probably if if you spoke to some of your friends now i mean i'll take that uh but i yeah i do quite like a nine nine o'clock bedtime so <laughs> yeah i think i think one thing that i am i find really difficult socially 
this sounds really I don't this probably sounds really cheesy maybe it's wanky but like having a knowing having a voice for myself I think you know I have no issue sitting here having this conversation with you knowing that you know maybe like someone might listen to it and that exposure but if you put me in a room of people and ask me to voice my opinion about something even though I've got plenty of opinions and plenty to say for myself I find that really difficult that's something that in sobriety I'm having to like work through mm-hmm. how to put myself out there a bit more without having like 10 pints of cider mm-hmm. so yeah, that's been a big change what was it like when you first started going out to social events after you decided you know what i'm i'm gonna stay away from alcohol were you anxious to explain to people i'm not having a drink no i get anxious about what i'm doing with my hands if i'm out with a group <laughs> mainly because i think uh, I was going to say, back in the day, I'd be holding like two drinks. So, <laughs> as you know, uh, stress at having to queue for that bar. I've been to events when I don't know people and I've stayed for 10 minutes and I've left because I just couldn't handle it. And like, even though you can rationalise it and you're like, you know, uh, it's fine. and But I haven't been able to handle that anxiety. So I've left and it's got easier. I don't find a need to explain myself to people. It's a really interesting one in that people take varying degrees of like not ownership but they feel quite comfortable asking you about like why you don't drink sometimes I'm quite taken aback by it sometimes I'm quite happy to be like I think the thing is is that at the end of the day labels are just ways in which other people can understand us whether we're you know whatever that label is so for someone to say like alcoholic I mean if it makes people more comfortable or put in easier terms it's like you know I have a really unhealthy relationship with alcohol like think of it like an allergy like some people are just not meant to drink and I'm one of them like fundamentally but if you need to call that an alcoholic to understand it that's fine I don't mind if people ask depending on what I'm feeling at the time depends on what I tell them sure who's your biggest fan oh oh you put me on the spot with that one I don't like that question I was gonna say myself but that's not true that's Uh, what I was hoping you were gonna say no I don't know I was going to say myself to be funny because that's a defense mechanism. Uh, I actually don't know. Yeah, I've got some good people in my life I'm very happy with. Good. So you feel supported. You're supported all the time. Or in terms of my sobriety. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that I'm not really sure about that one because I don't feel like anyone tries to undermine my sobriety. But at the same time, you know, if someone is very rare that someone is like, oh, you can have one to me but I think now these days like I try to really like own my sobriety much more so it's not like a it's just part of who I am like now and you know I don't put pressure on it these days like if one day I decide to have a drink I'll forgive myself for that that's fine but you know for now like it doesn't serve me yeah I'm not gonna do that it's amazing the importance that you can attribute to putting some liquid into your body that well, must be different you, in, in yeah. different situations i mean you're in a rugby team so if you go to the pub to celebrate after one evening everyone's gonna be drinking it's gonna be a very social event in the beginning that must have felt like pressure on you i didn't feel pressure because i knew what was better for me i definitely felt anxiety because you'd be like oh i don't especially when i didn't really know people and you're trying to have a conversation and you're sort of standing there and you're like you feel like the most boring person in the world but I think at the same time I'm very happy like, people do ask me you know if you go on nights out and stuff and I love a night out um a bit rarer these days but I are very happy to go for a dance until three or four o'clock in the morning however um firstly sober hangovers are real I feel like the next day like I've been hit by a bus and But also it's very much the people who you go with who make it. Like if you go out and you're not, you're not feeling the mood in that group, then it's not going to work for me. And like, I'm probably going to go home. Mm. I mean, that's not on them. But sometimes you're just feeling it. Sometimes you're not. But if you go out and it's a great mood and with a great group of people and you're having a laugh, like it's not about being drunk. It's about having a laugh. Sure. Yeah. Enjoying the moment. Yeah. hundred percent. And again, it's that like connection piece. If somebody approached you 
and said, you know what, I'm really struggling with this addiction. I know your story. What would your advice be to them? It depends what they're asking, really. I think if they're struggling, I think, as I said earlier, no one, no one will stop unless it's what they want to do, unless they really want to do that for themselves. Like, it's the most, it's like very, maybe like humbling is the wrong word, but that bit when you're like, you know what, I'm done fighting this. Like, you know, I couldn't moderate my drinking. I tried. It was so stressful trying to think about like how many I'd had, how many waters I had. Then I forgot because I just got too pissed. I think the moment when you just accept that it's not for you, but you have to accept that. No one can force that on you. And unfortunately, I think that's why, you know, a lot of people experience like a sort of rock bottom moment, which can be really quite horrific (laughs) in terms of sort of impact or what happens or like drama or I mean quite sort of traumatic pieces to come back from but it is about being at the bottom and the only way being up I think if someone if someone comes to you asking for advice my advice is amazing if you want to do it here to support you if there's anything I can do you know, if you ever want to come to a meeting like my friend who took me to a meeting I will remember forever but at the same time like it's something only you can do for yourself you can't rely on anyone to do it for mm-hmm. you So we're both members of the LGBT community. We like to have a great time. How have the LGBTQ community embraced sobriety? Are there support groups in that community? Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned that uh, my friend took me to a meeting in Soho. And this um, location hosts a number of meetings for different groups, like 12 step meetings. So whether it's like AA or NA, like Narcotics Anonymous or um, just a whole range of groups. And one of the groups that I really enjoyed going to was AA, but for LGBTQ plus people. I think because, I mean, for me, like a lot of the reasons why I drank were linked to a sexuality. And so- question I was gonna ask actually, yeah. Yeah. And being in a room full of people who had shared or similar like life experiences or some similar life experiences just made me feel comfortable. I could relate to people that I could engage with them on a different level. And actually that really helped me to accept my own alcoholism and to look at how I could move forwards. It's a really good point because coming out is a stressful time and it can be traumatic put that to one side and then you're sat in a room with a bunch of maybe straight people who don't understand being gay and coming out in that whole experience and then you're so you you're battling two things there and your your anxiety would be through the roof so i totally understand how a support group amongst your own peers would be much more comfortable yeah i think also you know if you look at the stats there's a lot a number of studies that will tell you that I think it's like one in six members of the LGBTQ plus community say that they drink every day. That's not to say they have a problem, but comparatively, one in 10 people who aren't part of the LGBTQ plus community would say the same. So there's a higher increase of people who do consistently drink more, or sure. more like every day than, than other communities. And I think that, you know, we've seen statistics that talk about how members of the lgbtq plus community are more likely to experience negative mental health than other communities which will make them more predisposed to substance or alcohol abuse and you talk about like lifestyle elements uh which i think we i have you know like i said each their own i think that sometimes there's a bit of like a gold standard that perhaps we we think we need to aim for is like part of the community in terms of being out and having a great time and like what that great time should look like but at the end of the day if it makes you happy great if it doesn't then yeah it's an interesting one there's also a number of charities so for instance like london friend who are a lgbtq plus charity i think the the oldest lgbtq plus charity in the uk set up just over 50 years ago they have a drug and alcohol service called Antidote, which offers like a range of counselling programmes and services, like support services for those members of the community who are suffering from substance abuse or addiction. Um, The work they do is incredible. 
absolutely suggest to someone who is struggling that they might reach out to them. What are three signs of resilience that you see in yourself? I'm trying not to be sarky in my comments because it's a, like, you know, one thing that I've, one of the reasons why I've really enjoyed doing these long distance, long distance running is because it gives you something tangible to measure your achievements against. So when you're having a really shit day or a bad day and that work's been on top of you, and you're like, oh, this is really difficult. But then you're like, but also remember that time you ran across Scotland, she can probably write this email. And that's quite nice. Uh, so I think that just, you know, put one foot in front of the other. That's something that I've got. Do look after myself now, which I think is a sign of resilience. I know what's good for me. I know what's bad for me. And I tend to choose what's good for me these days, unless it's like a tub of ice cream and then probably not happening. And I think that, I don't know if this is a sign of resilience, but you know, I think compared to four years ago or five years ago, I think my um, my life is like built on like a house of matches, a house of cards and, you know, just tap it. Whereas now it's much more stable, much more resilient. And I think yeah, I, was, I was someone, someone asked me about what the nicest thing about being sober is. And I was like, actually, the best thing about it I used to black out like all the time and um, to the extent I was like if I didn't black out I was like wow I clearly wasn't drunk and you know you could lose like five six hours or more of of your night and I remember just saying it's so nice to know like how you behave and so if you if you know that I'm allowed to swear yes yeah. you, know, <laughs> you can say whatever you want if I if I am an arsehole to someone I'm like I know that I am like fundamentally and I can own that behavior and I can choose to apologize if I'd like to whereas like back in the day if I was like I just wouldn't know about it but I'd have that like and so I think you just have all that anxiety and I probably just wouldn't have spoken to that person for six months as any rational human being would do out of anxiety so I think just having ownership of everything that you do and being comfortable with it and that really allows that sort of resilience I'm like very happy with how I am now even if, I don't think I'm perfect, but I can see myself for what I am. And you have control. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I like how you mentioned the house of cards or matches because I interviewed um, an American singer called Ty Herndon and he's recovering and he talks about the ability to build his village now brick by brick and make it strong. Nice. It's just interesting that you sort of said the same thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. Also, I don't feel special now. <laughs> uh, no, but no, I think, I think also having had like that sort of shakiness for such a long time, it's really nice to know that you're on something stable, but also that you've worked hard for it. I think the easiest thing is just to to press that button and you're in control you're in yeah. the driver's seat yeah absolutely amazing let's move into some quick fire questions this might make you more nervous than some of the questions i've already asked <laughs> probably I'm like, what are you find out yeah what am i going to find out about myself <laughs> <laughs> all righty let's begin quick fire questions um, what unusual skill or talent do you wish you had? For some reason, I really want to balloon model, as in like model balloons. As in like blow up balloons and make animals? Yeah. Okay. Like, don't ask me why that's, it's been in the forefront of my mind, but yeah, that is. I mean, on top of like, obviously I'd like to do like all the things like be able to sing and like draw, but just really fancy being able to make balloon animals at the moment. You should you should look that up. I'm sure there's a course somewhere. I hope so. Most interesting place you've ever visited? This is a recent one. I went to Sri Lanka over Christmas. I thought Sigiriya Rock was amazing. If you could snoop through one person's private life, who would it be? Oof. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of friends of mine who never tell me anything about their lives. But that would be... I'm not going to name them. No. <laughs> um, be, a bit, be a bit aggressive. No, do you know what, actually? I think... Oh God, it's gonna, this is going to sound like such a wanky answer, but I think I'd probably just like leave alone. 
I don't think I would give him the option, you know. I think like, like well, we've all got shit. Just <laughs> you crack on, do you know what I mean? What's the most outrageous thing you've ever done for love or friendship? Oh, had to add in love or friendship. You could have said the most outrageous thing you've ever done and we could have had a half an hour conversation on that. Okay, <laughs> buckle up. No. <laughs> um, so I have had a couple of misdemeanors in my life which were alcohol related. These ones are maybe amusing they're not too dark once i ended up walking naked across wortley bridge at four o'clock in the morning like butt naked having thrown my clothes into the thames because i left a bar in soho at three o'clock in the morning and i was in a very bad mood and my friend who um was worried about how drunk i was and so decided to walk me home to where i lived in elephant castle and i was so determined to be left alone that I decided I was going to, um, the best way to get him to leave me alone was to embarrass him into leaving me alone. So I told him that if he didn't leave me alone, that's going to take off all my clothes. Uh, and so he didn't leave me alone. And so got to the strand and I was like, right, off they go. Yeah, that happened. Craziest rumor you've ever heard about yourself? I, I feel like I'm a terrible interviewer, and I don't think I've heard a rumor about myself, at least one that wasn't true. <laughs> Have you ever had a celebrity crush? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. When I was younger, really like Colin Farrell, Ian McGregor. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get the vibes. They're very similar. <laughs> one thing you wish you could change about society? I do kind of wish that we could care less about what other people are doing. Just focus on yourself be the best you can like why you why do you give a shit about what someone else is doing if it doesn't affect you what life event has shaped you the most uh, i know it's like been a topic of this but i think probably getting sober it was at a time when i in the same month i started my own business with a friend uh, and i also got my dog and i don't think it's coincidence that <laughs> all three are still going <laughs> if that makes sense sure how do you define happiness I think it's just being with happy with what you've got. You know, you don't, you're not looking for something that you don't have. Best relationship advice ever given? I think the best advice, and this can be applied to like relationships, romantic or like friendships, so just don't be a dick. Do you know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. How do you cope with stress? Uh, exercise. Or eating, depending on what mood I'm in. Generally exercise. Does social media affect your mental health? Yeah, do you know, I think it does. I find, I think more that I'm more inclined to like doom scroll and then I'm not sleeping as well as I should in those pieces. But I don't look at social media and I don't think it, I don't think I focus on social media in terms of, you know, I don't benchmark my life against social media. If you were a kitchen appliance, which would you be? Spatula. Easy. I think they're just like incredibly versatile. Like, people need more spatulas in their kitchens, to be quite honest. It's true. What can't you use it for? Do you know what I mean? Love it. Weirdest dream you've ever had? Uh, I mean, we're not getting into that conversation, surely. I used to have the same dream, which was that I was, like, serve, like waiting on a table. And I'd, like, take their order and then go and put it into the till. And then I'd fall asleep at the till. Then I'd wake up in the dream and be very stressed about, like, where they were at in their service cycle. That was a constant one. Most used app on your mobile? Probably Instagram or uh, yeah, Instagram, WhatsApp, Spotify, maybe. What's your favorite pickup line? It's been a very long time since I've been picked up. So um, I, c I couldn't possibly say. Name three objects in your nightstand. <laughs> um, books, um, more books. Um, and like what is actually in it's just like a load of mess i've got like a million lighters in there your favorite number seven me too it's a good strong number do you have a nickname not that i'm aware of when i was younger no i'm not going down this road <laughs> when when um when i was very young and just like quite acerbic which may be a bit still now uh, but I had um nickname Poison Dwarf, which I understand was a Dallas reference or something like that. Favorite song at the moment? I'm liking, I can't really say it's song. 
but I'm liking generally like pink and Jolipa a lot. The wildest thing you've ever done that nobody knows about until now. Until um, Kev Jet. I think I think I've broadcast like everything that's remotely interesting about my life ever. I did feature once on BBC Breakfast News, like directing traffic in central London. That's another great story and possibly another podcast. Thank you. Have you ever had a paranormal experience? No. Do you believe in life after death? I believe something happens. What does the word friendship mean to you? It's like understanding and acceptance. What does being a man mean to you? I don't think it's any different to like, just like for me, it's like being a good person. It's like being comfortable with who you are and how you interact with other people and being able to take ownership of how you behave and be happy with it. Describe yourself in three words. Oof, I don't like these questions. They, they make me uncomfortable. I think that probably quite guarded. I think I'm quite funny. And I think I can be quite intense. What makes you happy? Peace, like the opposite of chaos. So yeah, out running, that's like happy place. What advice would you give your 14-year-old self? Just do it all and learn from it. You know, it's all, I, I don't really, in the same way, like I'm not big on regrets because it's all part of, and it's such, it's a cliche, but it's all part of how we get to where we are now. So I'd just be like, it's, you got to feel what you got to feel you, and you, it's something you have to go through. Name a book that had a positive impact to your life. Matthew Todd's book, uh, Straight Jacket. I found it a very difficult read. It's about society's legacy of shame that a lot of LGBTQ plus people grew up with and looking at how we internalise that and how that may manifest itself in our behaviours. I think for me that spoke a lot. I saw so much of myself and my behaviours with alcohol, particularly in that book. Really difficult read, but really helped me to understand myself. And I would, it also includes a huge number of resources available to people who might be struggling or who might want to learn more or who might have a friend who's struggling or a family member. So I would, without getting too on my high horse about it, um, I would really recommend anyone, um, whether you're gay, straight, or whichever community you're part of, I would really recommend everyone to have a read of it. Amazing. Thanks, Al. I loved our conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.